No matter what I may lose, I choose the refiner's fire. The, uh, when someone is trying to make a tree produce fruit, produce good fruit, produce abundant fruit, the, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the person that would trim the trees. Uh, arborist or a husbandman or, anyways, he'll prune, he'll prune back. So limbs will have to go. A limb will have to go so more fruit can be produced. And so it is in the Christian life. God sometimes says something's got to go so that you can be more fruitful for me. And it hurts. The fire hurts. Refining fire hurts. Pruning hurts. But it's for our good and for our fruitfulness. And uh, I always enjoy when Dan sings the, the song, The Refiner's Fire. Uh, would you please turn to Psalms 91, please, church family? I also wanted to say that uh, uh, Tanya Meradian came home today from Russia, and uh, she found her sister. Uh, 99.9% certain that that is her sister that she found in Russia. They were, they were um, separated in the wrong family at birth in Moldova, or switched at birth in Moldova. And um, it really is an amazing story. Um, so a television show was done over there in Moscow, and, and um, it's really an amazing, amazing story. So um, she's home. She told me to thank the Lord or thank the church for the prayers, and she's thankful to God for how he worked things out for her. And um, so I thought I'd share that with the fa uh, church family tonight, that it's, it's an amazing thing that God directed her to find that person uh, and really just did it through Facebook, wasn't it through Facebook, that she found this individual born on the same day at the same hospital in Moldova that she was. And... Um, and her suspicions were correct, that they were switched at birth. So amazing, amazing story. Uh, Psalms chapter 91. Let's enjoy this whole chapter reading it tonight. Can we do that? It's a great chapter. So just follow along, and I'll read audibly here. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. What a great chapter. I look at this chapter as being a solid chapter. It doesn't leave any loose ends. It stands by itself as a, as a monument. 
Uh, it is a beautiful chapter. The reading of, and by the way, I love the reading of the King James Bible. It reads different than the new versions. Um, of course, we believe that the King James is God's word without error. And so this chapter is solid, it's beautiful, and then it's profound. Very profound chapter with great depth that you could dive into this chapter and swim really deep to the bottom. Uh, what you think is the bottom, but you'll never really reach the bottom. It's so deep. The psalm does not have a title, nor are we sure who, who humanly wrote it. Uh, but you'll see that some of you, have, if, in your Bible, it may say under chapter 90. Do you see it's a prayer of Moses? Under chapter 90? And under chapter 91, there's no title? Uh, some say that Moses wrote 91 because it's a continuation of 90, and until a new name of a human author is given, Moses would be the writer. Others say that David wrote Psalm 91, that God used David to write it. Uh, I will tell you my opinion. I don't know. I don't know whether it was Moses or whether it was David. I do know this. It was God that wrote it. And so we take it as the words of God, and it contains great promises. I love the promises of this chapter, and they do pair very well with what Brother Dan and God have put on his heart to share with us tonight from the book of Isaiah. It contains great, it provides tremendous promises, but here's what's unique about the promises. The promises aren't for everybody. Not every promise is for everybody. Or let me say this. Not everybody can receive the benefit of every promise. Uh... I don't want to shock you too much tonight, but I think most of us seasoned Christians know many of God's promises have conditions. In other words, to receive the benefit of the promise, God says you must fulfill the conditions for the promise. And by fulfilling the conditions for the promise, you'll receive all of the blessings that come with that promise. Not every promise is that way, but most many of them are. It is a psalm that is wonderful to read when you're in danger. You ever felt like you're in danger? Uh, I was talking with one of um, the people at the wedding yesterday who lived in Romania. I don't remember who that man was. Houston. What's his name? Chip. Uh, came from Romania. And he was telling me about his grandfather who was arrested for preaching the gospel 15 years in jail in Romania. I don't think I've ever felt that kind of danger. And he uh, shared with me how hard it was for his grandfather not just to be arrested, but his grandfather had children and a wife. And it's one thing as a man to say, I'll go to jail. It's another thing to know that who's going to provide for your kids and your wife while you're in there. No welfare system over there at that time, communist Romania. And I've never really felt that kind of danger, but I have felt danger in my life. This is a a great psalm to read when you feel danger. It's a great psalm to read when you feel like you're exposed to some evil. Like there's an evil oppression or an evil uh, feeling or an, or an evil pressure on you that seems to overtake you. It's a great psalm in times of exposure. Or when you feel encircled by evil or the wicked one. This is a great, great chapter to read. Because it contains the promises that God will protect, Brother Dan. I think he's on guard tonight. He's, he's doing everything tonight, Dan. Is. God will protect. But the protection that is given to us here has conditions. And may I read them again tonight. He that dwelleth in the secret place, this is verse 1, of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God and him will I trust. I've called this message the secret place, the secret place. You don't have to read too deep to find out that God says to dwell in that special place under the shadow of the Almighty, under the wings, the protecting wings of God Almighty, of the Most High, then you have to dwell in the secret. You have to dwell in the secret place to enjoy the blessings of the shelter of the wings of God. 
In other words, to get in there close to our Savior, to get in there close to our Heavenly Father, to get in there close. Can I ask you this? How close do you got to get to be under a shadow? Pretty close. How close do you have to get to get under a wing? Pretty close. And so the encouragement here is, or maybe the command or the instruction is, to receive that fortifying protection from God. It is received by getting in there to that special close place with God. And there is imagery behind this. And whether it was Moses who wrote it or whether it was David who wrote it, it does not matter because the imagery can connect to either one. Do you know the temple that was, or I'm sorry, the tabernacle that was used in the Old Testament? The tabernacle was the worship place that could move. It was the church that moved. It was the church building that had ten stakes. And so they could construct this tabernacle, and they could use the tabernacle for any set of time, and then they could disassemble the tabernacle and move it to a new place and set it up again. And so they use this tabernacle in the Old Testament. And the tabernacle is a very unique building. If you've ever studied the tabernacle, how many have ever studied sort of in depth the tabernacle? I know some of you have. It's an amazing, it's an amazing study to study the tabernacle. And we're not going to study the entire thing tonight. But I did ask the guys to get a little picture ready. I know this is going to be strange. Did you guys get a little picture ready on that uh, slide thing? I hate to wake them up back there. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? What's going on here? <laughs> I found a picture of the tabernacle, and uh, I want us to be able to see it with our eyes, and I, with God's help, I'll be able to explain it a little bit, what this tabernacle looked like. God had instructed Moses on how to build the tabernacle, how large it would be, what items will be inside, uh, how, uh, what uh, uh, function each item inside of the tabernacle would have, and and uh, even the divisions of certain areas of that tabernacle were given instructions. Uh, Moses was given instructions about these tabernacle, uh, this tabernacle. And for the tabernacle, here's what I want us to get. The tabernacle was not the kind of thing that everybody, or let me phrase it this way. There were certain spots in the tabernacle that not everybody could go to. Right? Uh, looks like they need to get the picture again. There were certain spots in the tabernacle that were reserved for only uh, specially designated or assigned people. They were, in particular, the Levites who were given a, a, uh, uh, access to the innermost part of the tabernacle. So let me describe for it, uh, it, it uh, verbally here, and then we may be able to have the picture shortly. The tabernacle, most of the tabernacle was con consisted of what's called the, oh, there it is, look at that. It worked. All right, so the entire drawing of the tabernacle is that top one. And I know it's not super large. I can see it there in the back. The top one uh, is the entire tabernacle constru construction. You'll see sort of the, the, um, the fenced-in area there, the white fence. Um, and there's really only one large structure inside of that tabernacle area. That outside part, and I don't have a pointer here, but that outside part of the tabernacle is the place where anyone could go. And, and that part of the tabernacle, that outside courtyard, there was the brazen altar uh, at the beginning. Actually, let me just go over there and point. I think I can see. What did I do? Is this one out? This blue one? Is this on? I've got to wake another one up back there. <laughs> I do love you guys. Thank you. You've got to be nice to them. They could do bad things to, to, to me up here. Um, this is the brazen altar right here, and I believe this is the uh, brazen laver, if my memory serves me right. This was for the sacrifices to be put upon, and this was for cleansing. And this part of the tabernacle, all of this outer area, was really uh, free, except for Gentiles, but free for any is, is, uh, Jewish person uh, to go inside of this tabernacle. And, and often people would gather there during times of worship. You remember that in the New Testament when Zacharias, who was the father of John the Baptist, uh, was uh, doing his service in the temple, he was a priest. And the Bible says the people waited outside. So while Zacharias, who was a priest, was inside of here, this is, this is just a larger picture of that right there. While Zacharias the priest was in here, 
all the people waited outside till he was through. And it was in here that the angel, Gabriel, appeared to Zacharias and told him that he was going to be a dad. This is called the holy place right here. You'll see the candlestick. And this is the table of showbread. And this is the altar of incense. That was where Zacharias would have lit the incense as it was his ministry duty. So anybody could go here. Only a f only fewer, if you were a priest, you could go in here at select times. Um, but this place right back here, that place, does anybody know what that was called? That was called the Holy of Holies. And both of those separated by a veil. And inside of the Holy of Holies is the Ark of the Covenant right here. The Ark of the Covenant. This, if we were to divide this by percentage, this outer courtyard is 94%. This is 4%. That's 2%. So of the entire construction of the tabernacle, most of the people only had access to 94% of it. Even a fewer select group of priests had access to another 4%. And only one high priest could go into that 2% area, and that only once a year. And God said, this tabernacle that you're going to build, I'm going to dwell there. And I'm going to dwell, not in the courtyard, I'm not going to dwell in the holy place. God said, I will dwell in that holy of holy place. Once a year, one man goes in, 2% of space. Now, if you fast forward to the New Testament, many of you know, I think I'll be done with this. I'll switch back to this, guys. In the New Testament, when Jesus was crucified, there was a curtain that was torn. Everybody knew about those curtains. Every Jewish man knew he couldn't go past that one curtain, and certainly all the priests knew they couldn't go past that second curtain. But when Jesus died, the Bible says that the veil was torn. So in other words, what happened is God took his, took his heavenly hand and just tore that curtain in half. And by tearing that curtain in half, what in essence that means for us is salvation through Jesus Christ. Now get this, salvation through Jesus Christ makes us able to get in there. Which used to be reserved for only the one, one man, one person. And now God said, I'm letting everybody come in here with me. I'll let anybody get here close to me. I'll let anybody come into my presence. I'll let anyone who is, who is willing and, and, and able and serious enough to come in here right where I am. And I, I want to make my confession tonight. I don't get in there enough. I'm just telling you. And I'll even make this prophecy. Most of Christianity spends their time in the courtyard. And I'm throwing myself in that bunch. Knowing that I have access to go into the very presence of Almighty God, the Most High, and actually get under His wings and fall into His shadow. And I'm content to stay out there in the courtyard. Or maybe every so often I may venture into that holy place but not as often as I like do I go into the holy of holies someone would ask how do you know if you're in there well if you have to ask the question you ain't, you ain't in there when you're in there you know it when you're in real communion with God, you know it. When God is really working on your life, you know it. When the Holy Spirit is, is, is spreading all over your heart, you know it. It's being in that secret place, dwelling in that secret place, is where God said, I will give you the utmost protection there. I think there's also a, an allusion back to something else in the Old Testament. And I know you're familiar with this. 
there were ten plagues upon Egypt. And Moses had, um, was involved in these plagues on Egypt. <clears throat> I tried to list the ten and I failed, so I had to look them up. <laughs> the first plague was the rivers were turned to blood. The Egyptians said, we're not letting the Jews go. We're not going to do it. And Moses stretched out his rod over the river Nile, and it just turned red blood. Some people say, well, it just turned red in color. It turned to blood. The river turned to blood. And of course, Pharaoh, oh, I'm, I, you know, I'm sorry. I, I'll let them go. Moses put the staff over the, over the waters. The Bible says the fountains became clean and clear again. And then Pharaoh said, I've changed my mind. They're staying right here. They're not going anywhere. God said, okay, Moses, I got another thing for Pharaoh. It's going to be frogs. If you read it there in Exodus, I think it's chapter number 7, where they begin, the frogs came up on the land of Egypt, and there were frogs everywhere. So much so that Pharaoh couldn't get them out of his bedchamber. You remember reading that? I remember preaching a sermon years ago called Sleeping with the Frogs. <laughs> Pharaoh was pushing these frogs off his bed in his hard-hearted condition, pushing these frogs off his bed. <clears throat> the second plague was frogs, and Pharaoh said, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let them go. I, uh, I'll, I'll agree now. They can go. You can, you can, they, they'll be free. The frogs were removed from the land, but Pharaoh changed his mind again. Before I go through number three, number four, number five, number six, all the way number ten, there's something to remember as we go through these remaining plagues. And this is what I wanted to bring to pass. When the frogs came up on the land, they went into the Egyptian houses, but not Israel's houses. How are you going to keep a frog out of one house and make sure the frogs go in the other house? Give him a map. <laughs> well, God gave him a map, Gene. That's what God did, gave him a map. A street map, plotted houses, they're different colors. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful that God can put like a line and tell the frogs you can't go over? The next was lice. Bible actually says that the lice or the dust of the ground became lice. Dirt changed to lice. And the lice was flying everywhere and, and, and uh, causing such discomfort and torture to the Egyptians. But you can read it yourself and we'll look at a couple briefly. God put a line. And said to the lice, don't go over there. That's my people's place. I'll put you in the Egyptians' houses. I'll put you in the Egyptians' hair. I'll put you in the Egyptians' cattle. I'll put you in the Egyptians' animals. But not, not my people's animals. How can you separate lice? How can you separate flies? Flies were the next one. And God divided where the flies could go. They could not go upon the children of Israel. Imagine being an Egyptian and seeing all of this hurt that's coming on you because of the stubbornness of your Pharaoh and all of this hurt comes upon you and you look at an Israelite and they're fine. You look at their house and there's no trouble. The cattle. God put a division between the cattle that belonged to Egypt and the cattle that belonged to Israel. And only the Egyptian cattle died. We'll be back in Psalms 91, but I think it's good for us to see this in Exodus 8 and 9. Let's look at just a couple of verses here. We won't look at them all, but I think a few are, are necessary to nail this uh, truth down, at least for me. Exodus, let's do 8 first. Exodus chapter number 8.
Let me read verse number 22 of chapter 8. This is the, this is the uh, plague of flies. Chapter 22. The Bible says, And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, to the end that thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth, and I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. And the Lord did so, and there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. Now, I don't know if I've really, ever really thought of this this way. There was a black fog of flies in Egypt and a line in between Egypt and Goshen where a, well, not one fly would cross. Not one. God said, I'm putting a division right there. Some of you know the plague of boils. They had boils from the top of the head to the bottom of the feet. Those Egyptians. Sore boils, painful boils. God said, the Egyptians will suffer with boils, but not my people. Not my people. How about the hail, the locust? What I'm trying to get across in, in chapter number 9, I wanted you to see one also here in Exodus 9. I think it's verse number 4. What was it here? Exodus 9 and verse number 4. Mm -hmm. I'll get there. And the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt. And there shall nothing die of all that is the children, children's of Israel. And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. And the Lord did that thing on the morrow. And all the cattle of Egypt died. But of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Whether it was David or Moses, it doesn't matter to me. They were very familiar with the tabernacle. David used the tabernacle. Moses was given the instructions by God how to build it. They both knew the plagues that were upon Egypt and the division that God put between the Egyptians and the Israelites, how that God was the shelter, he was the protection, he was the barrier, he was the fortress behind his people. The Bible says that the closer we get in our walk with God, the more we'll be able to enjoy the fortress of our God. Let me give you some application that was on my mind. Have you ever felt vulnerable? Felt like you were um, easy prey? Do you know how to get rid of that feeling? I'll tell you how to get rid of that feeling. We get in there in that secret place with God, that feeling has to go. And it's sort of what Brother Dan talked about. God can remove fear. I have, um, one of the things that's uh, part of the ministry of being a pastor is to visit people in the hospital. And uh, I've been at the hospital when people have been suffering diseases and sicknesses that are unto death. Where well, the doctors have said, you've got a couple weeks. The pastor, when you visit someone like that, what do you say? You know what I've learned? I don't have to say much. Because God is able to take away the fear. Let me say, phrase it this way. I don't, for many of the saints of God that I've ministered to, and I thank God for it, I haven't had to work at getting fear out of them. Their dwelling with God removed the fear. Their closeness to God made the fear dissipate. 
getting in the shadow, getting in that secret place, by God's grace, getting out of the courtyard and going into that holy place and then even going into that holy of holies. When your prayer time is sweet, your time in the word is sweet, your service to God is exciting, your life is on fire for the Lord. Getting into that place takes away the vulnerability, takes away the fear. If you want fear to leave, get in there with God and the fear will go. What's the first word of Psalms 91? Anybody? He. I don't want to oversimplify it. Doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. Doesn't matter whether you're educated, uneducated. Doesn't matter whether you're young or old. Anyone who is 20 and, anyone who is under 20, please stand. Under 20. No, John. <laughs> Not even in dog years, brother. <laughs> 12, 13, 14, 15. Oh, 16, 17. 17 of them. Isn't that a blessing? 17. I'm looking out at these, these, these kids. And I want to I tell all of us older people, now hear me carefully, these young ones, I say young ones, some of them are, they're, they're, they're adults, they're young adults, all of them are, have just as much ability to get in that secret place with God as the most seasoned and longest saved among us. I'm talking to these girls up here and the girls there and these young men in the back and all of these on my right side. You can get in as close to God as you want to get. And that's the facts. You say, well, maybe they're afraid of what's going to face them in life. God can take that fear away. They get close to the Lord. Well, I'm afraid this world's changing. I don't know what it's going to be. I, I, you know, I just, I, the future is so scary. You get in there close with God, the fear goes. God takes it. He takes it away. It's like you're under his wings. Young people, I love you. We love you. You may be seated. Doesn't matter whether you're young or old. Doesn't matter whether you are clergy or layman. You say, well, the pastors, they get in there close. I'm here to tell you, we don't always. Pastors and deacons, oh, they get in there close. They're in that holy of holies. You'd be surprised how often we're not. Anybody can get into that secret place, but it's not something that you just fleet in and fleet out. In fact, the words here is dwell and abide in verse number one. Did you see them? Dwell and abide. You want that fear to dissipate as in verse number five? Look at verse number five. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. How can somebody say with such confidence, you will not be afraid? Because if you dwell in the secret place, you won't be. I think about those three Hebrew children. Children, they were young men. Boy, I admire those guys. Went to the king and said, look, we don't care whether we go into fire or whether we don't go into fire. But either way, we're not bowing. And of course, I've read that story a lot of times, so have you. I don't sense fear from those young men. I don't sense that they're trembling or shaking on what's going to happen. I think they had, they had spent so much, in, in a pagan land, this was Babylon, they had spent so much abiding, dwelling time in the shadow of the Almighty that they said, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Fear has, in some ways, gripped our Christian culture because we're not spending secret time. We're afraid to speak out for Christ. We're afraid we might lose our job. We're afraid that what else may happen. We're afraid that who knows what the circumstances may do. We're afraid a loved one may cut us off. We're afraid that of all these things. But dwelling in that secret place, that would give you courage. And that place, that secret place is so secret, even the worst of evil can't find you. God can put you in a place where even Satan can't find you. 
Satan may be looking and looking and looking. Where is he? Where is she? And God's got you under his wings, protected. How about when you feel unloved? These are just some things that run my mind. When you feel unloved. Well, you hear that today, especially in, in, in church um, conferences. They say you, you need to help people feel loved. And I do understand for the unsaved, the love of Christ ought to be on, our, on us so much that people can see it. And we ought to love the lost and ought to love the unsaved and desire to see them born again. But you know what, what really is, is, uh, is troubling is when Christians say they feel unloved. And I begin to think, how can a Christian feel unloved when there's so much scripture about the love of God? The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts and for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And God commended this love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's not unusual to have a Christian say, I feel unloved. Can I give you a, an antidote for feeling unloved? You get in the secret place with God and you'll feel loved. You get in there close to God in your prayer and your scripture and your service and you're just walking with him on a regular basis. You get into that holy of holy place and you cannot come out of that place and not feel loved. His protection will overshadow you. Someone may say, well, no one cares about me. No one cares. No one understands what I'm going through. We hear that sometimes. Nobody understands. My family don't understand. My pastor doesn't understand. My spouse doesn't understand. Nobody really understands the pain I'm going through. I'm not trying to be too, I don't want to be coarse or rough with this. But I feel very strongly about this. When I get in that secret place with God, I know when I leave that place, God cares. God cares. The solution is not finding a man who cares. The solution is not finding a woman who shall care. The solution is not finding someone who will give us love or someone who will show us love or trying to find someone who will make us feel safe. The solution is getting in there close to God and he gives us all of that. Gives us all of that. It takes a resolve. It takes a resolve. Statement in verse number two, the resolve of this psalmist, whomever he may be, here is his resolve. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Look at his resolve in, in uh, verse, uh, where is it here? Um, boy, now I'm missing it. Oh, verse number nine. Because thou hast made the Lord, now listen, here's his resolve, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. It takes some resolve to get in there close to God and to feel the protection that comes in that secret place. So here's what I wanted to say tonight, and maybe I spent too much time saying it. Has it been a while since we've been in a secret place? Has it been a, a little bit of time since we got in the shadow? Has it been a little bit of time since we nestled in under his wings? Everything seems to be set right when we get in there. When we get in there. I'm not going to stand before you some in a pious way and say, oh, brother, I'm there. Sister, that's where I live. I'm telling you, whether it's the preacher or a six-year-old child, we struggle with getting in there and staying in there 
But I'll confess to you tonight, I want to. I want to stand there close to the Lord because there's so many benefits in that place. So many benefits. Can we bow quietly for prayer tonight? Just for a moment as we pray. Now look, I, we always give an invitation, and, and I'm not the kind of person who tries to push for, for numbers or for results.